The year was 1944, and one of the most critical crusades in all of history was being waged. The aces, Richard Peterson, Bud Anderson, Chuck Yeager. More than 50 years have passed, yet the success of these pilots in World War II still resonates amid the growl of their airplanes. The P-51 Mustang. This plane gained its mythical status as the only fighter with enough range to escort bombers deep into Germany. These men and their machines cleared the way to bombing targets and crippled Hitler's air force, bringing the German dictator's Third Reich to its knees. We picked up our first P-51s in England in January of 44, picked them up at the assembly factory and flew them for about an hour and a half over England and landed at our base at Leiston. The next day, we're sitting over Leis Leipzig, Germany, fighting in them, and that was the transition. That was it, and uh, you learned just from experience. We weren't very well checked out in it, but. We were amazed how capable the airplane was, especially in endurance, it was just fabulous. It came at the right time, at the very time that the long-range bombers were having so many losses and were questioning whether daylight bombing was uh, even feasible, suddenly the P-51 appears. The opponents in this airborne joust were the elite of the German Luftwaffe, a proficient tactical air force. The German pilots had dominated the skies for much of the war, flying thousands of missions in the worst of conditions. The German pilots would see and engage the enemy every mission they flew. See, and that's the reason. If you look at the kills, like Eric Hartman, 380, uh, uh, General Gunther Rall, who's a, a very good friend of mine, and, you know, uh, 270 or 80. Uh, an American fighter, on average, he flew about 50 missions over Germany, then he went home. We have flown already three years, or four years. And where I, I personally, I can, but this is an example for, for many of them. I was injured in those days uh, three times. I was in hospital. I was uh, uh, recovered, came back to the front line, flew again. So this is quite a different attitude. The German fighter planes, the ME 109 and the Fokker Wolf 190, were known ironically as Jaeger, the German word for hunter. They were short range aircraft, able to dive, turn, and reach great speed outstanding in their armament, which shot down Allied planes with deadly efficiency. There was this mixture of weapons, and they were unbelievably effective. It was almost scary, the power we had. You can't believe what it feels like to watch a B-24 lose a wing, or even fall completely apart in just a few shots. The 109 was truly an excellent aircraft. Tremendous power, tremendous speed, tremendous maneuverability. And I think testimony to that is, in fact, the, the fact that it did shoot down a lot of American aircraft. Throughout 1943, before the Mustang's arrival, the theory was that the bomber alone could fly over Germany's front lines to strike directly at aircraft and ball bearing factories, transportation, oil refineries, and aluminium plants. Targets which, if destroyed, 
would deprive Hitler of the means to wage war. The bombers evolved into flying fortresses, outfitted with guns front and back. Their speed, armor, armament and high altitude flight were to enhance self-defense during attacks flown in the bright light of day for target accuracy. Most existing US and British fighters could not fly to the bomber's maximum distance without running out of fuel. Fighters had only one role, and that was to defend the air bases from which the bombers flew. Uh, they were spot interceptors uh, to, to prevent any sort of counterattack. But as far as uh, escort fighters, not necessary. Autumn 1943. The bombers faced devastating losses, culminating in what was known as Black Thursday. Hitler had massed his Luftwaffe forces. Swarms of German fighters charged after Allied bombers as they attacked industrial plants in Schweinfurt on October the 14th. Well, unfortunately, they had to go the last third of the way without any escort because the P-51s were in business yet. And in that particular raid, there were roughly about 300 bombers in the thing. And they shot down 100 of them. That's 30%. In fact, it was 31% is what they lost. <laughs> and the, the Germans were having a field day. By 1943, the Germans had learned their lesson and they had put long range armaments on their aircraft. 20 millimeter, 30 millimeter cannons that could reach beyond the range of the 50 caliber. And as such, the B-17s and the B-24s simply could no longer defend themselves. The skies witnessed slaughter on an unprecedented scale. 10 men died for each bomber shot out of the sky. Only the fortunate limp home. The self-defense theory of the Flying Fortress was an utter failure. The 8th Air Force had lost the battle for air superiority over Germany in one of the most savage air encounters of the entire war. That's when they said, we've got to have a long-range fighter that's going to go. How far can the bomber go? We've got to have a fighter that's going to do it. Enter the P-51 Mustang, a long-range fighter that had been simmering on the back burner of the war for two years. For their first months in service, the new fighters were instructed to fly close to the bombers. The bomber crews at last had air support. But air strategy continued to evolve. Air Force leaders realized strategic bombing alone would not win the war. And a new leadership took over in, in the fall and winter of 1943-44 that realized that, yes, yeah, strategic bombing can still work, but we've got to achieve air superiority first so that the bombers can go in and actually do the damage they need to to these industries. But moreover, they've got to support the invasion. And they realized that any invasion of Europe would be impossible without control of the air. There is complete agreement that an invasion six months from now would fail, would fail. So in um, early January 1944, the commanding general of the 8th Air Force decided to what he called free the fighters. General Jimmy Doolittle declared that there would be a dual role for the new fighters. They would continue to protect bombers on the way to their targets. But more importantly, the Mustangs would be free to fly away from the bombers to pursue and destroy the Luftwaffe.
the Mustang cleared the skies over Europe to make way for an imminent Allied invasion of the European continent, enabling Allied troops and equipment to land with no threat from above. It was Britain's quest for a new fighter plane to shore up its fleet against Hitler's advances, which brought about the P-51 Mustang. Just six months from design to test flight, the first incarnation of the aerodynamic Mustang was delivered from a US company, North American Aviation, to Britain in 1942. The early Mustang lacked power at high altitudes. The solution was to install a powerful Rolls-Royce Merlin engine with a supercharger. You have tremendous power at sea level for takeoff, but with the supercharger, it allowed you to have that same kind of power at, uh, at a high altitude. The US Army Air Forces ordered 2,000 P-51s when they realized they needed just such a long-range fighter to prepare for an invasion of Europe. The new engine used about half the fuel of other fighters. With its elevated nose, the Mustang had limited field of view on takeoff causing pilots to weave down the runway so that they could see on either side. In late February 1944, over a five-day period, the largest American heavy bomber force ever assembled more than a thousand bombers, escorted by 900 fighters, flew into Germany, determined to destroy the Luftwaffe in the air. And the industrial plants below, where the planes were manufactured. The fighters flew to protect the bombers as detached escort, free to roam ahead, above, or to break off and pursue the enemy. We used to do slow zigzags uh, across them. They're going slower than we are, and we're trying to keep our speed up. So you make 90 degree turns and stay on top of them. We also would send out flights out to the side and up ahead to try to break down these groups that were going to come in head on. The Luftwaffe's integrated radar and flight command centers picked up the mass of aircraft as they made their way across the English Channel. We were geführt von einer Fliegerleitzentrale. We were directed by a central flight control office. When we took off, they knew exactly where the American bombers and escort fighters were. And they led us straight to the planes. We saw the big contrails of these bomber streams, you know, and I was looking for the fighter escort. Where are they? And how are they? And how high are they? The minute you saw any contrails coming, you knew that it was the opposition. <laughs> you got ready and you used your tanks up to the, the outside gas is uh, up to its fullest. And you didn't use any inside stuff until you had to. And then you dropped the tanks and you were ready to engage. Richard Peterson engaged a German on one of his first missions. Got so excited, I didn't realize I was holding the trigger down. And I'm shooting holes in the sky all over the place and uh, holding the trigger down because I was so excited. And I finally got strikes on this guy and he pulled the canopy and bailed. He went drifting on by me, standing at attention, gave me a highball salute and pulled the ripcord. And I thought, boy, that's pretty, that's pretty great. He had black boots on, the blue flying suit and he had black gloves. That was great. <laughs> the hackles on the, and I was yay shouting to myself in the cockpit, you know, about how great this was. But that was the first one I got. Over the skies of Germany, the Allied planes faced two levels of German fighters. 
the Fokker Wolf 190s attacked the Allied bombers, while the ME 109s attacked the Mustangs. When your big bomber streams came escorted by long range fighters, some of the Eastern experts were called back to the home defense to, as a, to fly as a top cover and to engage American fighters so that the heavy groups could attack the uh, B-17s and the B-24s. The American squadrons attacked and attacked again. Leipzig, with its sprawling modern aircraft production complex. Schweinfurt and Regensburg, responsible for producing ball bearings and airplane parts. Americans lost 150 bombers and 35 fighters. German casualties were much worse. During these six days of February, known as Big Week, the Germans lost a third of their aircraft and a fifth of their pilots. Prior to Big Week, the young and influential German fighter commander Adolf Gallant was desperately trying to prevent these very losses, calling for all existing German defence fighter planes to be based in a central location, not scattered across German-held territory. You know, Hitler uh, was, uh, I don't know how well informed he was. They didn't regard the build-up of what's the British and the American fighter force or of air force uh, as he should have really seriously done. No, they didn't do that. Hitler's response was to refuse this defensive strategy. Instead, he informed Luftwaffe leader Hermann Göring that German forces should escalate their bombing missions against Great Britain. And so this philosophy was a not existent in the Hitler's or Göring's mind, and uh, Hitler was warned. Hitler uh, didn't pay give very much attention to the fighter fleet over Germany. He said, oh, it's anti-aircraft. We stuff the whole thing with under air car. We don't need these fighter, fighters. We got the we got the we got the lesson, you know. President Roosevelt, on the other hand, recognized in 1938 the need for heightened military air power. His push for aviators paid off at just the right time. There were 7,000 combat pilots in 1940. After Pearl Harbor in 1941, there were over 100,000. Pearl Harbor broke out uh, December 7th, and January 13th, I turned 20 years old, went down, raised my right hand, and uh, there I was. Some pilots knew instinctively that they were destined for the skies. I was 12 years old at the time. My teacher asked around the room, we'd go around when we started school, what we wanted to be when we grow up. I responded when it came to my turn to be, I want to be a fighter pilot and shoot down Germans. Her name was Miss Weisbrod, and she almost hit the ceiling. <laughs> German background. I'd never seen an airplane uh, on the ground before I got in the military. I mean, they meant nothing to me, and I didn't have any burning desire to be a pilot like Andy. Hell, he'd hang on fences and work and, and flew before he got in the military. I. I I was raised in West Virginia and they didn't have airports and airplanes back there. And I never flew in one until uh, I think it was January of 42. I changed an engine on my AT-11 and my engineering officer came down to test hop the airplane and said, get in, you're going with me. And that was my first ride in the airplane. I got sick and, and I didn't think there's much future in it. So. But Jaeger eventually saw there was indeed a future in it when he became an ace in a day shooting down five German fighters in the same air battle. But even good pilots had their bad days. After just eight missions, 
Chuck Yeager got shot out of the sky by a Fokker Wolf 190 over Bordeaux. We were down south of Bordeaux and escorting B-24s and some 190s jumped us and I was tail in Charlie in a flight and broke into him and made a head-on pass and I got hit 20 millimeters so making a head-on pass. So. The thick armor protected windshield saved my tail, a 20 millimeter hit it and it, it crazed and I lost uh, about half the left wing and, and the prop came off the airplane and it was caught on fire when I got shot down. And... There was no time to panic. The 21-year-old pilot released his parachute and spiraled from 5,000 meters to the ground below, German-occupied France. With shrapnel wounds in his hands and feet, Jaeger limped off into the deep brush and spent the next six weeks dodging Germans. Meanwhile, the rest of the 8th Air Force was in the midst of the next stage of their quest for air superiority over Germany. The bombing target moved to Berlin, the home of Adolf Hitler. The armament on the Mustang would be decisive in influencing the outcome. Now from the rear of the aircraft, you can see the back of the wing. Uh, this area here is covered which covered the three chases of the ammunition. Our ammunition was called API, 50 caliber, armor-piercing incendiary. And it's a steel encased uh, chunk of magnesium on the, on the end, on the business end of the shell. So when you hit and got a strike on an aircraft, it was a flash. It also drove the magnesium in to set fire and explode the airplane. So that was the whole purpose of API ammunition. Every tenth shell was a tracer, so you could see your line of fire by the tracers that were lighted every tenth shell. When you get near the end of running out of ammunition, every shell was a tracer, which alerted you to watch it, you're running out. It was now March 1944, just three months before D-Day. The goal was to lure the Luftwaffe into battle at all costs, and then destroy it through attrition. The way to get the maximum number of German fighters in the air was to go after a prize target. Carl Spatz was strategic air commander of the US Army Air Forces in Europe. Jimmy Doolittle headed the 8th Air Force, tasked with preparing the continent for an Allied ground invasion. Spatz tells uh, Doolittle at 8th Air Force, no more diversions. I want all those bombers over Berlin. I don't want diversions. I don't want to try to confuse the enemy. I don't want those radio messages trying to get them to go in the wrong place. I want them to come up and find us. March the 6th, 1944. Fighter pilots awoke before dawn to the drone of bombers flying overhead. The slow-flying bombers left early. The Mustangs would catch up later. The fighter group gathered for a briefing. It's what the pilots had been waiting for. The map showed that they were flying to the eastern edge of Germany. Target, Berlin. The group went over the engine start times, rendezvous points with the bombers, targets, and courses home, information dutifully recorded on the back of the pilot's hands. The pilots synchronized watches before making their way to the awaiting Mustangs. Ahead lay Germany and the heart of the Reich. Bomber crews were less enthusiastic than the fighter pilots, as General Spatz described their mission. He told them when they flew to Berlin, this is one of the most dangerous missions of the war. It scared the willies out of these guys. We told them, I want you flying straight and, and, and level all the way to Berlin. Your job is to attract the German Air Force. Now, of course, he can't tell them that. Uh, they'll know their bait, they'll know their sacrificial lambs, can't do that. 
but in fact, that's what was happening. How do we know it today? It's because Spots and Anderson wrote it in their diaries. They didn't use the word bait, but nevertheless, it's quite clear from their diaries they intended for the bombers to be bait. The bombers had good reason for concern. There was more to fear than German fighters alone. The Germans operated an early warning network of radar and gun batteries, all coordinated under the umbrella of the Luftwaffe. The fighters flew with the bombers until they were nearly on target, then broke off as the bombers headed unescorted straight into a flak barrage to drop their deadly load. And from the initial point to the target, it was straight and level. And that's where they were so darn vulnerable. Oh, man. They had to get lined up, of course, for the target. Get lined up in a bomb site, do the wind correction, and all this kind of stuff. From the initial point to the target was their time for dropping the bombs. We would stay, boy, I, the flak would come up. You could walk on that stuff. It looked so black and heavy. You can see the bombers. The threat of flak did not stop Doolittle and Spatz from making Berlin a regular target. Over the next 16 days, the 8th Air Force would return four times. It's very brutal warfare. It's the kind of attrition warfare we know from uh, Gettysburg and from Petersburg in the Civil War. It's the kind of warfare we know from the trenches in World War I. It's attrition warfare. Kill more of them than they kill of you, and you win the war. You've got to bleed the Luftwaffe so that when June 6th comes around, the uh, German Air Force will not be there to stop it. The battles included some brutal realities for Richard Peterson. Normally, nobody, including the Germans, would be shoot anybody in a parachute. It just wasn't done. I mean, there's no, there's no challenge with shooting a guy in a parachute, for God's sake. He is, uh, uh, I mean, he's had it. You can't miss. And uh, here I came across this 109, and the sky was full of bomber shoots. Flack had gotten them, and it was target area. And this um, it was going from parachute to parachute shooting up guys in parachutes. Oh, I got just, I mean, this was too much as far as I was concerned. And I didn't want him, I didn't want to blow him up. I wanted him to bail. So I was pecking away at him, just hitting him. Just, and I'd get strikes on him. And he knew I was there, and he knew I was getting strikes. He finally pulled the canopy. I said, oh, you met your maker, Buster. And I fired, I damn near emptied my guns on this guy. He was mincemeat by the time I got through with him. And uh, he was in a shoot. And of course, other guys who weren't there were nervous about me shooting a guy to shoot. But they had to be there to know what I was seeing with this guy going, these guys are helpless of a bomber cruise going down. And I just, uh, I just tore him up. Yeah. With 800 rounds a minute, you can do a lot of damage with 50 caliber shells from six guns. So that was the end of that. US losses on missions to Berlin were high. 69 bombers and 11 fighters shot down on March the 6th alone, more than on any other day in the war. But the Mustang had overwhelmed its opponents. 1,000 German pilots were killed in the first months of the Allied air campaign including 28 top-scoring aces. Hitler had put his faith in Blitzkrieg, a lightning war, massing all available men and material to ensure a quick victory. The Luftwaffe had exhausted its ranks. There were no reserves to replace the battered pilots. One of the key days in the air war over Europe was March 9th. This is where the bombers went to Berlin and fighters went with them, and the German Air Force did not come up to fight. The Luftwaffe did not come up to fight. Every, uh, after that date, March 9th, uh, there were days where the German Air Force would not come up. 
There were other days where they would come up in large numbers. Um, prior to March 9th, they might come up in formations of 10, 12, 14. After March 9th, they would come up in formations of 90. Uh, 100. And the reason is because it gave them a better chance for success. It made them better able to perhaps survive that mission. The bait strategy of the U.S. Army Air Forces was working. Thanks to the Mustang and its range, air superiority over Europe was shifting from Germany to the Allies. The Mustang was assigned one last task before Allied ground forces landed on the coast of France shoot up German aircraft on the ground, shoot up uh, uh, locomotives, uh, shoot up assembly areas, uh, shoot up anything they could find on the ground. In fact, there are all sorts of after-action reports that in fact uh, had uh, fighter pilots claiming to shoot cows, arguing that, you know, it's, it's part of the war effort, we need to shoot them. Imagine the, the psychological effect of Germany, is like, as I say, Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, precisely 11 o'clock on the minute, all of these fighters descend on Germany. Strafing had been described as air guerrilla warfare fought at treetop level, an extremely dangerous mission for the Mustang. It was not the airplane for the job. The P-47 and the P-38 were by far better airplanes for the job. The P-38 had liquid-cooled engines, but it had two. So you shoot out one, still come home. The P-47 had no liquid cooling. It was air-cooled. So you could shoot the heck out of a Pratt & Whitney 2800, and it would still run. Connecting rods would be popping out of the cowling, and the oil would go over. The guy just flew around. It didn't matter. P-47, very rugged. One little bullet hole in a Mustang, and you're down. And all the great aces of World War II, except one, and the European theater went down to ground fire. The missions were useful, however. The fighters smashed communications and transportation networks and destroyed Luftwaffe aircraft as they sat silently on the German airfields. The strafing success prompted General Eisenhower's pre-invasion pep talk to paratroopers about to drop onto enemy territory. He kept telling them all the same thing. It was the only thing he'd really tell them with any assurance, and that was, when you look up, you're going to see airplanes, but they're going to be ours. And they were. On June the 6th, 1944, Allied troops swarmed over the French coast of Normandy. The invasion had begun. In the skies above, only two German combat missions even attempted to fly over the beachhead. German pilot Willy Unger escorted bombers on a mission to attack invasion fleets with little success. Terrific. Completely black with ships, my God. And they were all shooting at us. The bullets were zinging all around us, just like in the movies. As long as you weren't hit, you were fine. If you were shot at, that was it. You would fall into the sea. But it was truly fantastic. The sea was completely black with ships. It was a miracle I didn't get hit. Large craft, small craft, everything under the sun. Amazing. Mustang pilot Ted Conlin found no Germans to fight, so he decided to fly down to observe the Normandy landing. We dropped down to about 1,000 feet off the beach. All we saw were a tremendous number of ships and people being killed on the beach. And it was a very unpleasant sight, if, you know, from that viewpoint. So I was kind of glad to get back up on top and do our job up there. The invasion revealed a grim reality. The Luftwaffe were caught weakened and unprepared for the Allied onslaught. I had to go inside to retrieve my pack. When I came back out, my plane was gone. A training pilot flew it to Germany. So I had to find another plane. After searching around for a while, I saw a plane without a propeller. The maintenance crew took parts from two other damaged airplanes and we put together a propeller. 
And then I flew a day or so trying to get back to home base. I was completely exhausted. The Luftwaffe leader Adolf Galland's memoirs state, the enemy, our own troops and the general population asked the obvious question, where is the Luftwaffe? The Mustangs and the bombers had done their job so thoroughly during Big Week in bombing Berlin and on strafing missions that when it was time for the Allies to invade, the Luftwaffe were nowhere to be found. An historian called D-Day one of the greatest air battles of all time, one that never actually took place. By mid-1944, Allied troops were battling their way across the European continent, through France and Belgium, on their way to Germany. In bomber streams that were often 160 kilometers long, the British and the Americans continued to smash German oil refineries and communications. Hitler was running out of resources as he tried to stave off Americans, British and other allies on one front and the Russians on the other. By now, the end was near. With the final air war raging above Germany, Chuck Yeager, shot down over occupied France, had made his way back to his squadron. I got a French underground, spent a, six weeks with them, went through the Pyrenees into Spain, was interned in Spain. With the help of the French underground and disguised as a woodcutter, Jaeger made his way through southern France, then trudged through hip-deep snow over the Pyrenees. After one close call, encountering Germans in a mountain cabin with bullets whizzing by his head as he escaped out of a window, Jaeger staggered into Spain and turned himself in. When he finally reached his squadron in England after six harrowing weeks, Jaeger was told he would not fly combat missions again. If you're in a, working with the underground, the Mach E, obviously, and if you go on another mission, you're shot down. Uh, then if you're captured, uh, then you compromise the underground system. After refusing to go home and appealing directly to General Dwight Eisenhower, Chuck Yeager was allowed to continue combat flying. His permission papers can be seen peeking out of his pocket in this photo. It just so happened that the invasion started on June the 6th, 1944, and June the 8th I was allowed to go back on combat. Once he returned, however, Jaeger had trouble finding any action at all. I only saw German fighters on five of my missions. That's all. When the Mustang pilots finally encountered German fighters, they were easy targets. The Luftwaffe was on its last legs. No fuel, few pilots, and little training. To add insult to injury, Hitler and his air commander Hermann Göring berated the Luftwaffe pilots for their losses, calling them lazy. Göring ordered that every pilot refuel at least three times before being allowed to disengage the enemy. Some flew more than five sorties in a single day. There were fewer and fewer pilots and the training became insufficient. The younger pilots received a much less thorough training than we had. Sometimes pilots received only the most basic flight instruction before they took off, and they never returned. We had to cover an airspace from the North Cape to El Alamein, to North Africa, with about 700 fighters. It was too less. So we didn't have the same philosophy as you. You know, you pulled out uh, a pilot after 50 missions. We let them fly, and I always say, we had the chance to get an Iron Cross or a Wood Cross. And we had tremendous losses, particularly from 44 onwards, in the hope defense, what we called Reichsverteidigung. The average survivability of a young pilot were three missions, and they were killed. And we knew exactly in every mission when we called, every second won't return to the base. And then you have to keep the fighting morale up. This, this is a problem. In his diary, 
One young German pilot wrote, Every time I close the canopy before taking off, I feel that I am closing the lid on my own coffin. Rubble and ruin abound where once proud cities had stood. By the start of 1945, Germany had suffered the full fury of the Allied bombers. Carpet bombing was now employed upon the hapless cities. There were 600,000 dead and wounded civilians. The goal was to break the will of the German people, forcing them to blame their government for starting the Armageddon. German pilot Günther Rahl tells of returning from duty to find his block bombed. All the houses flattened, except his, a story to chill the heart of every husband and father. Many other things happened, you know. My, my wife lost two children by bombing. Uh, she was pregnant and premature delivery, six months out. She was attacked in a train when she came to, to my venue. I got her out from Vienna when the Russians came. So I get her out, I sent somebody and get my wife out. And she was in the six months. And the, air, and the train was attacked by, by mosquitoes. And the, the guy who was an Air Force, out, down, down, can you do six months? It was gone. So, this was a war. Yet, the will of the Nazis still had not been broken. This despite the fact that the Luftwaffe no longer controlled the air. The Nazis had one last chance to drive away the Allies, the ME-262. This was the world's first operational jet fighter and a rival to the Mustang. You were feeling like a king in the air. You were against the king. I was singing loud in my aircraft because I never had the last, the last year was a very bad one. And out of this, sitting in the aircraft in the 262 and flying the 262, it was unbelievable. The Messerschmitt 262 flew at a top speed of 860 kilometers per hour and attacked Allied planes as it roared through their bomber streams. What's more, it didn't need conventional high-octane fuel, which was in short supply. If you're going to go through a, a fighter escort at 500 miles an hour, a top speed 400 mile an hour Mustang is not going to catch you. And so you just go straight through the bomber formations. In March 45, they were able to do this to some degree, and it would take out 10 bombers at a pass. Very, very dangerous, yes. Hitler could have had this remarkable jet fighter earlier, but his mindset was purely offensive, so he ordered the ME-262 to be made a bomber. In 1944, he finally conceded that he needed a weapon to fend off Allied planes. By now, though, Germany had no resources, no chromium, no metals, to make a fleet of 262 jet fighters. And the funny thing is there were hundreds more built, but they were all sitting in fields with no engines. So it was a moot point. While the Mustang couldn't overtake an ME-262 in level flight, it could position for attack by cutting off the jet in a sharp turn. Alternatively, attacking the ME-262 as it attempted to land was another favored method. I just glanced out the corner of my eye and spotted this uh, ME-262 was on the final about three miles out. He obviously was about out of fuel. And uh, I rolled over and head on past him and pulled in. You know, I was doing it about 400 mile an hour and pulled in behind him and opened up at about 200 yards and got a good concentration of hits on his right wing. Left right outboard wing blew off the airplane and he went into the the ground about a mile short of the runway. It was very unsportsmanlike, but what the hell, that's the way it goes. By April 1945, bombers had simply run out of targets. Two Allied fronts converged in the heart of Germany. Much of this success was attributed to the Mustang's role in achieving air superiority.
On May the 8th, 1945, the Germans made an unconditional and simultaneous surrender of all land, sea, and air forces. After nearly six years of flying, Willy Reschke and other German pilots handed over their planes to the Allies. It was just difficult for us to conceive that the last shot had been fired, that the war was over, period. After six years, you get used to the war. The civilians as well. They've been through days and nights of bombings. They won't forget that for the rest of their lives. You can't just shake that off in one day. It takes time. After the surrender, Mustang pilot Roland Wright saw the destruction the bombers had wrought on the shattered country. Germany, uh, Munich was practically uh, totally destroyed. The building was just rubble everywhere. You had to walk down the streets. There was no streets, you know, just, just absolute uh, rubble everywhere. And uh, you could see the, the, the suffering that they had endured, too, over there. So it was a... It made you glad that it was all over, really. I felt that I did my part to bring that to an end, and that was it. The battles of 1944-45 in the European theater were not the last the P-51 Mustang would fight in. The Mustang floundered in Korea in the 1950s. Pilots flew low-level missions, constantly exposing the plane's vulnerable underbelly to ground fire and flak. As jet fighters arrived, the Mustang was decommissioned. Today, the most experienced pilots fondly remember, and some still fly, the mythical P-51 Mustang, the dependable fighter that carried them straight to the heart of the Third Reich, and ultimate victory.